All right. Well, in the 1980s, there was a German woman by the name of Marion Bachheimer, uh, whose daughter was kidnapped and tragically killed at the, uh, the hands of a violent man named Klaus Grabowski. And there was no doubt of Grabowski's uh, involvement in the crime, that he was the killer. The evidence was overwhelming. And add to that, when the police uh, caught up with him and arrested, uh, arrested them, he confessed, confessed fully to the crime. He was arrested, and eventually he went to trial for this terrible crime. And with each day that uh, passed during the trial, Marianne, the mother of this seven-year-old victim, grew increasingly angry and agitated. And on the third day, somehow she was able to smuggle a pistol into the courtroom and in a moment of sheer rage and anger and and in an act of vengeance, she would take that pistol out and shoot her daughter's murderer dead right there in the courtroom. I want to ask you this morning as we start, I know that's an intense story, but what is justice? particularly in a case like this where such violent w- violence was committed against an innocent child. How is justice realized? Who carries it out? Now, as you can imagine, the story was much talked about in the German news media, and some people weighed in, and they were totally fine with it. He got what he deserved. Others said, we don't need vigilantes coming into our courtrooms and issuing their own form of justice. I'm kind of in that side. We don't need people coming into courtrooms with guns. Um, But justice was for the court to decide, is what, what those folks were saying. Is it just to return violence with violence? Now, I realize even in a room this size, there would probably be heated debate or disagreement as to that question. And we're not going to have that debate today, don't worry. Uh, But this morning, I start with that tragic story because these same questions emerge out of Jonah chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. Hopefully, as we delve into these two chapters, we'll get a clearer picture for what I mean uh, when I say that. And I'll unpack more in a moment. But Nineveh, uh, the city that Jonah was called to give a word of, of, of repentance to, was known for their violence. And how does someone deal with such a place that has such a reputation? How does God deal with such a place? Well, his words were very clear. Turn from your violence. Turn from your wickedness. And so I want you to hang on to those questions and those ideas as I give a little recap as to where we've been so far in Jonah chapter 1 and 2. Today we're in part three of our series through the book of Jonah. And up until this point, we saw in part one where Jonah received a word directly from God for a foreign people. And as you might remember, Jonah ignores God and he runs in the opposite direction of Nineveh. Uh, I said in that first week, you know, uh, when, you, when you think of Jonah, the book of Jonah or the story of Jonah, everybody talks about the big fish and it's only like two or three verses Probably the second thing that people know is that Jonah ran. Jonah ran in the opposite direction. Well, he gets on a boat headed for a city called Tarshish, and things don't go so well for him on that boat uh, or the people around him on that voyage. His disobedience to God's instructions affects not only him, but it affects the sailors on the boat. A great storm came up and rose up, and, and they were throwing cargo overboard just to lighten the load. But on the plus side, these sailors seem to make a dramatic profession of faith right then and there, which, by the way, is kind of the point of the original word to Jonah for the Ninevites, right? Go to a people who do not know me with a word of correction, a word of repentance that they may change their minds and their ways and their violent ways and turn to me. While the sailors figure out that Jonah is to blame for the stormy waters that are throwing their boat around, and so Jonah fesses up and says, you might as well throw me overboard. And they're a little timid about that request. They kind of have this quick prayer meeting with God and say, we don't want to be guilty for this man's life, uh, but uh, 
they, they heave ho and they let the man go. They throw him overboard. And God, in his abounding grace and loving kindness, gives Jonah a big fish to swallow him up and camp out in for three days. And while he's in there, he says a prayer, which, by the way, Pastor Brian did a masterful job a few weeks ago at unpacking that prayer for us. And the last thing that we heard of Jonah at the end of chapter 2 is that the fish expels him out onto dry land. He vomits him out onto dry land. And now we rejoin the story in chapter 3. Read with me if you have the, uh, your Bibles. The words will be up on the screen for you. Jonah, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, here it is now, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Period. And the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. In chapter 4, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Pray with me for a moment. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this story, uh, the truth of this story. And Father, I ask God that you'd speak through me this morning, that, your, that my words would be your words and that you would be honored and glorified in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here in the beginning of uh, chapter 3, Jonah, unlike chapter 1, decides that after running from the Lord, it's probably better to obey God's instruction. And by the way, the same is true for us. Much better to listen and obey than listen and reject the Lord's words to us. How often has God shown us grace even when we are disobedient? Thank God he is the God of second chances. He's always uh, stepping in our direction, moving in our direction, and inviting us to respond to his grace. So Jonah journeys towards Nineveh, and you'll notice in verse 3 how the text points out the massive scale of the city. It would be similar to New York today. Massive in scale, but as I already alluded to, it was also known in the ancient world for its military might and prowess and cruelty and violence. Uh, the Ninevites took cruelty to a whole new level. I don't have time to detail all that today, but it's a sordid history, and you can certainly look into more of that if you want, but you're going to have to take my word for it. They were a violent and cruel people. 
And it was known for the kind of violence against others that it's hard for us to even comprehend. They had a reputation in the ancient world for the acts of violence. And knowing that, you can kind of appreciate Jonah's apprehensiveness a little more, right? Uh, To even set foot in the city. I mean, with the reputation that they had at the time, Jonah was definitely putting himself in danger by even setting foot there. But it's not just that he was in danger. You see, Jonah had a different opinion than God about what should happen to the people of Nineveh. And when they repented, which they did, His true feelings come to the surface, and he expresses them. Look at chapter 4, verse 1 again. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. A little hard to translate the Hebrew here, but the idea, it, it could be translated, he became violently angry. You see, what the Bible's revealing to us is that not only did Jonah not want to give a prophetic word to a foreign people, he wanted them to pay for their violence. Just like that grieving mother in that courtroom in Germany. He wanted them destroyed, which is probably why he waits outside of the city once the word is given. He kind of wanted a Sodom and Gomorrah kind of scenario. He wanted to repay violence with violence. He wanted justice, or at least justice as he would define it. And so Jonah ventures in. He delivers, I mean, such an eloquent gospel presentation, the likes of which we may maybe never have seen since. He's a real wordsmith. I think the TED Talk people reached out to him and said, Jonah, what a great talk. We want you to give you a TED Talk at our next conference. Let me remind you what he says that is so convincing. He says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. That's the whole sermon done. You can go home. We didn't even have a chance to have a break. There's no coffee. I mean, cue the music, right? Think the old hymn, Just As I Am. But people are coming to the altar, or uh, actually the more modern song is Come to the Altar. Wouldn't this, this sermon make you drop everything and come forward asking to receive the gospel? Not really. This is no TED Talk. And I, I kid you, but don't miss that God uses it anyway. And the response seems to far outweigh the delivery. And friends, I just want to remind you that this goes to show you that God can use even the feeblest attempt of you and I bearing witness of the gospel. You might think that you don't have eloquent words, that you can't put a sermon together. But like we said last week, when the Holy Spirit pours his fire into you and onto you, and there is truth in in your words because of him, there is no stopping what he wants to accomplish. Amen. Amen. Well, the king gives a declaration of a fast and wearing of sackcloth. I I, I find it so funny every time I read through this story that even the animals got involved. Even the animals were fasting and praying. I don't know. Do they pray? But they were definitely not eating anything according to the king's decree. And sackcloth, just a quick word about sackcloth. Sackcloth holds a significant meaning within the cultural context of the Bible. It's often a marked time of mourning or repentance and humility. And people would wear sackcloth and sprinkle ashes on themselves as a sign of sorrow and repentance. And in many ways, it was a physical manifestation of their inner state by which they were demonstrating their grief or their penitence to God and to others. And so the king of Nineveh is calling out to the people to seek forgiveness for their violence, for their evil ways, to express a profound grief over their personal and communal sin. And so this was a humble way to seek forgiveness and restoration. He takes the prophetic word seriously. He gets news of it and he puts out a decree. This is what we're going to do. You might have noticed in verse 8 that when the call goes out for this urgent prayer and fasting to God, it came 
And I've already mentioned this with a call to turn from evil and violence. Violence must stop in Nineveh. And so the king calls for turning from that violence. And the people of Nineveh turn from their violence. They repent, which means they changed their direction. They changed the way that they were going, the way that they were living. And friends, that was good enough for God. Don't miss that now. They turned from their ways, and that was good enough for God. And the scripture says that he relents and does not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Some translations actually use the word repent. God repented. Now, I don't think that God repents, but he does, it, it, the scripture does say that he relents. He, he changed what he had planned for them. He changed his mind. Now, you would think that with Jonah, that he would be happy with this outcome, right? I mean, when, I'm, when, I, when I deliver a word to somebody and I see some change, I'm like, victory here. This is like, this is, I'm, this is a good day. You would think that this would be like the ultimate day in Jonah's career. Because if you think about all of the Old Testament prophets, most of them, they gave the word to the people of God and everybody said, shut up and get out. They didn't receive the word. But here, Jonah's word, the word that God gave him to deliver to these people was received. And yet he doesn't celebrate. He doesn't rejoice with them. Because he had violence in his heart. And he didn't have room for them, those people, those foreigners, those pagans, and I don't mean that in a negative, in a pejorative way, but those people, those people who do not believe in Yahweh, he didn't have room for them to receive a word of repentance and turn from their ways. But that's exactly what they did. And I wonder this morning how you might have reacted. I wonder if you can bring up in your mind, stir up in your mind, not just a person, but a group of people who represent violence and evil. And let's say God asks you to give them a word of repentance and they receive it and they change their ways and all of a sudden they are walking and living in a different direction. How would you have reacted? Well, let me remind you what Jonah says. He says... And, and I'm going to kind of try to superimpose what I think he, how I think he's saying this in verse 2. Isn't this what I said, Lord? This is, what I, this is what I was trying to avoid by fleeing to this city that was in the opposite direction. I knew that you are gracious and a compassionate God that you are slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew that you were going to not destroy these people. And this is why I didn't want to deliver this word. And so rather uh, than rejoicing in God's grace to a people who have humbled themselves and taken and received in the word of the Lord delivered to them seriously, Jonah says essentially, and he says it, I would rather die. I'd rather die than live in a world where a God would extend grace to a people like this. I knew you were gracious. I knew you were loving, but I wanted these people to suffer and instead you extended them grace. Take me out, Lord. I don't want to live in a world like that. He says in verse three, now Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live. He's, essentially he's saying, I knew you were going to left, let them off the hook. And, and, and I think that if Jonah had the ability to destroy these people, he would have done that. And God asked him an interesting question. And this should give us some insight into our own souls. Have you any right to be angry? Don't you remember the grace that I extended to you when you disobeyed me, when you ran in the opposite direction? Don't you see the grace that I gave you in giving you a large fish, fish to hang out in for three days that I sustained your life? 
that you aren't just floating aimlessly in the sea to drown and, to you and meet your ultimate end? Don't you see that I was gracious to you when you disobeyed me? How can you be angry? Have you any right, God says to Jonah, to be angry? You see, the reality is God in this story refused to accept both Nineveh's violence and Jonah's anger or angry violence. He doesn't let either of them off the hook. And, and, and in, in, line, in, in light of the scripture, in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel is answer to violence is not more violence. It's grace and love and peace. Now, I, I, I want to go, I want to dig a little deeper, and, and I'm a little nervous about this because I, I, it's a little heady, but I'm going to jump in there anyway. Jonah clearly had a deep sense of morality, okay? Can we agree on that? Not a bad thing. It's not a, a bad thing to be a, a moral person. There's nothing wrong with morality, living by a standard, pursuing holiness and the things of God. But there comes a danger when our pursuit of morality becomes moralism. Because in a sense, it makes us the judge and the one from whom justice comes. And that, my friends, is a mantle that none of us are equipped to carry. Because ultimately, God is the judge, and if he sees fit to extend grace to another, we dare not stand in his way. I don't think that you and I would want his grace blocked from us, would we? I mean, I stand before you today over the course of my life, and I tell you, I, I've been on the receiving end of what seems like an endless amount of grace. And I need that grace to keep on flowing towards me. I don't want anybody to stop that. Don't you want God's grace to keep flowing towards you? And you see, Jonah, in his efforts to be religious and take the moral high ground, actually stoops to violence himself. Do you see that? Are you following me? Are you with me, what I'm saying here? In an effort to, to keep the rules, in, 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 in an effort to represent God, he actually doesn't represent God because God extends grace to repentance, and Jonah wants them to pay for their violence. And he becomes violent himself. And his violence stems not, because, not, not despite his, his status as a prophet or his religiosity or his moral standing, but because of them. And his anger arises precisely because he is moral and religious. To him, these are sinners, they're heretics, they're pagans, and these are the bad people and they deserve punishment. And I hesitate to say this next uh, line, but it needs to be said that religion can also be so a source of violence. And many of you are not surprised to hear that. Hear me say that. You look at history, you look at our world and the conflicts that are currently taking place, and you know that religion, not faith in Christ, but religion, I'm making a distinction here, religion can lead to violence. So let me bring it a little closer to home if you are a Jesus follower like me. Religion, even in the context of Christ's church, can be violent if not kept in check. And I'm not just talking about physical violence. I'm talking about emotional and societal violence, oppression and subjugation. This is how cults emerge and can be so violent to their own people. And you see, religion or ultimately moralism, not morality, is what killed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And notice I didn't say the Jews killed Jesus. I'm saying religion killed Jesus. The religious players of the day, Jesus didn't quite match up to their neatly ordered boxes. He healed on the Sabbath. They said, what is this? It's the Son of God. And they said, no, he doesn't, he doesn't match up. He doesn't line up. He's not good enough. And because he didn't line up with their 
or fit in their box, they took them out because of it. Do you see the danger there? Do you see that if we are not centered on Jesus and the truth and the power and the hope and the love of the gospel of grace, then we are on the wrong course and it leads to all sorts of violent places. If we're centered around Jesus, Jesus' message is love and grace and forgiveness. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is not the judge. He is. But he's the judge, not me, not you. I heard someone say once, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't remember the exact quote, the danger of morality without grace leads to oppression and violence. Let me say that again. The danger of morality without grace leads to oppression and violence. See, God is searching for hearts that are soft enough to repent. And apparently the Ninevites had received that word and their hearts had softened enough to receive the word and change direction. And I've already mentioned this, but you need to know this, that God is running after you and me with his grace, that he is eager and, and ready and quick to extend his grace, especially to people who will say, okay, I received a correction. I repent of my sin. I turn from my wickedness and I start walking in your direction. I seek you, Lord, and you only. He does that to all of us. And if by chance, now hear me now, if, if by chance we happen to be in proximity to someone like that, who received a, receives a word of correction and is extended an immense amount of grace, the way of Jesus, the way of the kingdom is to respond with joy and support of that person, not judgment and anger. You might remember the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 7. Jesus draws a line in the sand, literally, and says, he who is without sin casts the first stone. They're ready to stone her. They're ready to kill her. And every one of them, having a moment of intense introspection, drops their stones of judgment, and they walk away. Well, back to Jonah. He delivers that eloquent gospel message, and somehow they respond. And if that is not a miracle of God, I don't know what is. And of course, because as Jonah says, God is gracious and he's compassionate, that he's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, a God who relents from sending calamity, God offers hope and compassion in response to their repentance. See, ultimately, the framework of this, it really centers around forgiveness. God is offering forgiveness to people who have run up a very large tab of debt, a debt of violence. And for most, if not all of us, present company included, this is a hard pill to swallow. I'm not saying this is easy. It's why the gospel is so scandalous. We say things like, you're going to forgive these people, God? You're going to forgive the criminal hanging on the cross next to you right now in this moment with the life that he's lived? Now you're going to say, this day you're going to be with me in, my, in paradise, in my father's house? The free gift of grace and forgiveness in light of wrongdoing does not fit our understanding of just, justice. We want people to pay for their wrong. And listen, if we do not repent of our sin, there is no doubt that there is a penalty for that which God himself is going to issue, but it's up to him, not to us. He's the judge, and there is a penalty, but Jesus steps in the way. And when it comes to forgiving another, we, it's not like we forget. We don't forget. That's bad advice. Don't forgive and forget. Forgive and remember, but cancel the debt. A few years ago, someone was over at my house, and they broke something. I'm not going to say what it is, because I don't want that person to feel bad. People have broken stuff out of my house, so that's a general comment. But it was an accident, of course, and there, but there was no offer to replace this item. It was broken, and there was no offer to fix this or to pay for it or anything like that. It was just 
I had this thing and now I don't have it anymore. I actually still have it. It's still broken. And it bothered me at first, right? But in order for me to let that go, I had to absorb the cost. I had to forgive the debt. I paid for that thing. That thing was broken by somebody else and I had to pay. I had to absorb the cost. And this is what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's what he details in Matthew 18. He absorbed the debt of our great sin upon himself, and he forgives our sins. And in Matthew 18, there's the parable of the wicked servant, and, 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 and we see this servant, and I'll summarize it real quick for you, this servant who has a great de debt, millions and millions and millions of dollars that he could never repay, and the master forgives him his debt. And he says, go, with, be in peace. And, and that guy goes, and, and he's on the road, and he sees somebody who owes him money. And he says, hey, that guy owes me money. And he goes after him, and he beats him up. And, and the master hears of this. And the master says, I forgave a debt that you could never repay, even if you won the lottery. And I set you free from that debt. I absorbed that debt. I forgave you. And yet you have the nerve to go out and beat this guy up for the little money that he owed you? See, this is what's happening here. Jonah can't comprehend the fact that this great debt has been forgiven because of repentance. He wants them to pay. And so it's so important for us to keep grace in view when we interact with others. Because you know what? You have your own debt. And I have my own debt. We have our own debt to deal with instead of worrying about theirs. And this is what God is doing with Jonah when he says, is, is it right for you to be angry? Don't you have your own debt? Don't you remember how you disobeyed me and I extended grace to you? Why should you be upset that these people who are fasting and praying and taking this word of repentance seriously, why are you angry? You see, if our relationship with God, and, and daily we need to take in this message of grace and love, if our relationship with God upward is right, and if our relationship with ourselves is right, then our relationship with others are also right. Even those who sin against, against us. Now, I want to close today with another courtroom scene also a true story and more recent. I think I might have used this some years ago, but it's so powerful, I, I, I'm going to use it again. A few years ago, you might remember a news story out of Dallas. Amber Geiger was an off-duty police officer, entered her neighbor's apartment thinking that it was her own, and shot an unarmed man by the name of Botham Jean, in his own home because she thought he was in her apartment and not his. A tragic accident. And if you followed the story, right after she was sentenced, so here we are at a sentencing hearing in a courtroom, she was sentenced to 10 years in prison for the murder, and Botham's brother, Brant Jean, did something that caught everyone by surprise. He said during his impact statement that he did not want her to go, go to prison. He said, and this is his quote, I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what Botham would, have want, to, would want for you. And the best would be to give your life to Christ. And then he said these scandalous words, I forgive you. I love you as a person and I don't wish anything bad on you. And then he walked across the courtroom and hugged her as she cried. Oh, the hand wringing that ensued in the media. Everybody was talking about it. Lawyers and activists and politicians. They said things like, how can he say these things? He should have said this or that. But forgive? No jail time? He gave her a hug? Now, that's not a typical scene in a courtroom in a sentencing hearing. But you know what? That's totally norm normal in the kingdom of God. You see, because Brant Jean understands his own debt. 
And it's not that he doesn't mourn his brother's loss. And it's not, it's not that he can't have feelings of, of disappointment and, and even anger towards his brother's murderer. But he understands the forgiveness and grace that God has extended to him. And because of that, he was able that, to extend that to his brother's murderer. Now, this is not easy to do. I'm not saying it's easy. But when you and me understand the tab of debt that we ourselves have run up in our lives and God's unending grace extended to us, we are able to do what seems impossible. So let me ask you a few questions as we close. How do you treat your labor, neighbor in light of the grace that God extends to you? Are you an ambassador of grace or judgment? Especially when somebody repents and turns from their evil ways. Do you rejoice? I wonder how God is asking you, maybe in this season of your life, to step out of your comfort zone and out of your moralism, because we all fall victim to that. How is he prompting you to step in the direction of another person who was lost in their sin? I know that this is a hard word. But God did an amazing thing in a violent city. And that tells me that the Bible speaks of endless amounts of hope and grace. That the possibility of grace, the possibility of, of change, of, of transformation is always possible because God is always running after you. Do you know that if you know Jesus today, he was running after you first? Do you know that he continues to come after you right now, even in this moment? Do you know that if you, if you do not profess Jesus as Lord and Savior, he's still coming after you? He still pursues you? And that it's not over until you've taken your last breath? Do you know that God, his love is amazing for you? You think of the parable of the lost sheep or the lost coins, that the, that, that the, the lost sheep that God, that Jesus describes him leaving the 99 others to go after the one. Do you realize that that's the kind of love that God has for you? That he never stops running after you. His goodness, as we sing often, is running after you. Amen. Amen. And praise God for that. Because I know I needed rescue. And he came to my rescue. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Amen?